Good morning. <laughs> I'm Julie Pinsano, and I'm happy to serve this congregation as a member of your Board of Trustees. Thank you for joining us both in line, online and in person. Um, and please scan the QR code on the screen up there um, to let us know that you are here, get a digital version of our order of service, and find our donation page. If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. We have a first time visitor gift for you at the greeters table and one of our beloved volunteers will be available here at the front of the worship center by the candle table over here to share our getting to know you, you information. Please take a moment now to silence your cell phones and whether this is your first visit or your 500th we welcome you to come chat with us after the service to learn more about who we are and what we believe here at First UU. <clears throat> Please find me or another member of the board in Beach Hall after the service to chat about all things church. Um, we have a few announcements this morning. This Friday, April 5th, you're invited to join us for our monthly First Friday pa pasta dinner at 6.30 p.m. See the Friday news for a link to sign up and help host, or just come join us for food, fellowship, and fun on the first Friday of each month. Our next Pathways to Membership class is coming up on April 13th. If you're interested in learning more about what membership looks like, please sign up to attend. Ask Reverend Kelly or another member of the welcome team for more information. And our annual stewardship campaign will have its big kickoff next Sunday, April 7th. Our theme this year is weaving the web of community. There are several luncheon and dinner events happening throughout April. See Friday news to RSVP for attendance so we can make sure we have enough food for everyone. We hope to see you there. And now, please rise in body or in spirit to sing our opening hymn, number 269 in the Gray Hymnal. pronouns and I serve as your minister of congregational life. Welcome to the first Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbus. 
We begin this service by acknowledging that we gather on the ancestral lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Wyandot, Miami, Seneca, Erie, and Cayuga people. We cultivate this awareness that concrete acts of solidarity, healing, and reparation accompany our symbolic acknowledgments. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, and it is my pleasure to serve as your developmental minister. I use she, her pronouns. Let us enter into the spirit of worship with these opening words by Julia Hamilton. It is Easter morning, and I am here, and you are there, and somewhere between us are flowers, and above us, the true blue sometimes, dream of, of sky, and underneath us the illimitable earth, breathing as she always does in cycles of death and rebirth, everything which is holy, which is everything, stands between me and you, the infinite of all existence, the great happening is happening all around us, that is to say life is happening and the sun is rising again, over us all. Happy Easter. Let us all rise in body or in spirit while our children meet in the back to prepare to bring in the light. Please turn and greet your neighbor. <clears throat> time for our children to bring in the light.
We light our chalice this morning with words from Elizabeth Strong. May we join with the miracle that is Easter time and enter into life with hope and love. Let us resurrect with spring. Let us resurrect with the spirit and enter into renewed life as we gather into our time of worship together this Easter morning. Thank you, Bianca, for your help lighting our chalice this morning. Good morning. morning. I'm Amber Scott, and my pronouns are she, they. I'm a white millennial with long, wavy hair, and I'm wearing a bright floral dress with a shawl and bunny ears. (laughs) Today's story, I'll warn you, might give you some feelings, and it might be something you've experienced before. It's called The Tenth Good Thing About Barney, written by Judith Viorst and illustrated by Eric Blagvad. My cat Barney died last Friday. I was very sad. I cried and I didn't watch television. I cried and I didn't eat my chicken or even my chocolate pudding. I went to bed and I cried. My mother sat down on my bed and she gave me a hug. She said we could have a funeral for Barney in the morning. She said I should think of 10 good things about Barney so I could tell them at the funeral. I thought and I thought and I thought of good things about Barney. I thought of nine good things. Then I fell asleep. In the morning, my mother wrapped Barney in a yellow scarf. My father buried Barney in the ground by a tree in the yard. Annie, my friend from next door, came over with flowers, and I told good things about Barney. Barney was brave, I said, and smart, and funny, and clean. Also cuddly, and handsome. And he only once ate a bird. (laughs) It was sweet, I said, to hear him purr in my ear, and sometimes he slept on my belly and kept it warm. Those are all good things, said my mother, but I just count nine. I said I'd try to think of another one later. At the end of the funeral, we sang a song for Barney. We couldn't remember any cat songs, so we sang one about a pussy willow. Even my father knew the words. Then Annie and I went into the kitchen with mother. She gave us orangeade and butter cookies, and she left the box on the table so we could have seconds. I gave my seconds to Annie. I miss Barney, I said. Annie said Barney was in heaven with lots of cats and angels drinking cream and eating cans of tuna. I said Barney was in the ground. Heaven, said Annie, heaven. So there. The ground, I told her, the ground. You don't know anything. My father came in from the yard and took a cookie. Big mouthed Annie said heaven again. I said ground. Tell her who's right, I asked father. She doesn't know anything. Maybe Barney's in heaven, my father began. Aha, said Annie and stuck her tongue out at me. (laughs) And maybe, said my father, Barney isn't. What did I tell you, I said, and I yanked Annie's braid. Father made me let go. We don't know too much about heaven, he told Annie. We can't be absolutely sure that it's there. But if it is there, said Annie in her absolutely sure voice, it's bound to have room for Barney and tuna and cream. She finished another cookie and went back home. My father told me he had to work in the garden. I said I'd help, but only a little. I told him I didn't like it that Barney was dead. He said, why should I like it? It's sad. He told me that it might not feel so sad tomorrow. My father had a packet of little brown seeds. He shook some out on his hand. The ground will give them food and a place to live, he said, 
and soon they'll grow a stem and leaves and flowers. I squeezed the packet open and looked down to the bottom. I told him, I don't see leaves and I don't see flowers. Things change in the ground, my father said. In the ground, everything changes. Will Barney change too, I asked. Oh yes, said my father. He'll change until he's part of the ground in the garden. And then I asked, will he help make flowers and leaves? He will, said my father. He'll help grow the flowers and he'll help grow that tree and some grass. You know, he said, that's a pretty nice job for a cat. My father and I planted all of the seeds in the garden. Mother made sandwiches and we ate them under the tree. After lunch, we worked in the garden some more. <clears throat> At night, I still didn't want to watch television. When I turned out the light, my mother sat down on my bed. She gave me a hug and I said I had something to tell her. Listen, I said, and I told the good things about Barney. Barney was brave, I said, and smart and funny and clean and so cuddly and handsome. And he only once ate a bird. It was sweet, I said, to hear him purr in my ear, and sometimes he slept on my belly and kept it warm. Those are all good things, said my mother, but I still just count nine. Yes, I said, but now I have another. Barney is in the ground, and he's helping grow flowers. You know, I said, that's a pretty nice job for a cat. The end. Spring is a time of growth and renewal and just one part of the wheel of the seasons and cycles of life that we are all a part of. Sometimes endings are also a new beginning. Our young people are about to go do spring festival activities, including an egg hunt, but after the service today at 1130, we will also be throwing color powder in the style of the Hindu holiday Holi, and everyone is invited to come participate or at least watch the spectacle. Now let us sing our young people back to their families and out to class. In the month of March, we have been sharing our donations with the Pathway Clubhouse. Pathway Clubhouse is a community-based program of psycho psychosocial rehabilitation for people who have a mental illness. The Clubhouse model began in New York in 1948, and through BREAD, the organization that we volunteer with and organize with, First UU fought to bring Pathway Clubhouse to Columbus. Membership in the clubhouse is lifelong and at the member's discretion. The holistic clubhouse model includes opportunities for social interaction, developing relationships, employment, education, and building community. Please use the QR code on the order of service or on the screen, or go to our website, firstuucolumbus.org, and click the Donate tab to share as you feel called. Your gifts help build a better church and a better world. Thank you, our offering will now be received.
Thank you, Nathan. We have some celebrations and concerns in our community to share with you this morning. Laura Hartman is saddened because a colleague at work has cancer and the prognosis is not very good. Bob Letcher was recently diagnosed with cancer of the tongue. He will begin radiation soon and calls are welcomed and appreciated. And Kristen would like to share her gratitude for letting us, for letting her share herself last week in our disability awareness service. I invite you now to join with me in a time of meditation and prayer with these words from Julia Hamilton. Spirit of hope. Settle into our bones on this Easter morning. Remind us once again that the dawn light is never a gamble. If there ever was a sure bet, it is the sunrise. Even stones crumble, even grief changes and shifts, and death is a mystery that is certain but not solid. But hope is like the sunrise eternal and bone bred within us. We are creatures built by sunshine and cannot carve this hope out of our bones if we tried. And yet, people have tried. Tried to entomb the light, tried to seal off the morning. Emperors and kings, priests and patriarchs have brought down death, certain but not solid, on any who point to a new dawn. In these fearful moments, we can be forgiven if we stumble and doubt and deny. But still, the sun rises and calls her children into bloom. Always, she says, always I will return. So don't despair, all is not lost. The small ways of the petty tyrants never win. So place your money on the sunrise. Who are we to bet against glory?
as is traditional in this congregation, I invite us all to celebrate the beginning of spring by singing the spring verse of number 73, Chant for the Seasons. Winter rains have turned the star wheel, springtime is upon us. Winter rains have turned the star wheel, springtime is upon us. Sharp the smell of long, bursting in our eyes, the turrets of the tulip. Winter rains have turned the star wheel, springtime is upon us. Greening is the grass, soft upon our brows, the sunlight warm caresses. Winter rains have turned the star wheel, springtime is upon us. As I have mentioned before, several years ago, I had the privilege of visiting Israel and Palestine. It is a hard place to visit for many reasons, I'm sure you can imagine. Though if I spend too much time thinking about what's happening there, I can now, I can plunge into despair. But for now, I just want to reflect on what I experienced then. It was remarkable to me how dry and unforgiving the land is in most parts, particularly of Palestine. The idea of trying to coax something green and living out of such dead ground takes a feat of imagination. Walking such ground gave me new insight into the stories that we hear from the Christian Bible. I visited many of the places that Jesus was said to have visited and walked many of the paths that he was said to have walked. And I began to imagine how a message such as his, a message of love and acceptance and new life, might bring a hope never before imagined at that time to those people. The people who followed him were people who tried to coax a living out of this land and so I want to ask you to join me in my imagination of what happened at that time. There was a fisherman, some shepherds, a woman who had left her tribe behind, people who were hardly ever considered special. They suddenly found themselves becoming a part of something more incredible than they could ever imagine. Instead of having to struggle for each bit of nourishment, a new kind of way of being had been brought into their lives. Their lives now felt important. They understood things that they never really knew before. I imagine it was like a gray cloth had been pulled aside and behind it was this brand new sparkling world full of adventure. And the adventure kept growing. The group of followers got larger and larger, and they began to be known wherever they went. Sometimes huge crowds would gather to just see the one who brought this new message. And they would be touched. The followers would be touched by people who just wanted to touch someone close to him. He did something to people not through a magical power from afar, but by showing them that they had magic within themselves, that everyone carried the key if they would just use it. But then the movement started to get too big. The crowds grew larger and more rowdy, and the man was more and more outspoken in his criticisms of the powers that be, that wasn't such a problem before, but now they were so well known and the crowds were so huge that the powers that be began to pay attention. 
One of the followers wanted the man to use his influence politically, but he refused. That was not the point, he said. He was after something deeper, something more meaningful, something that would change people's inner lives as well as outward circumstances. And then the worst thing happened. The political one betrayed him, turning him into the authorities. They couldn't imagine it, the followers. One of them who traveled so far with them, turning on him now. But the man himself seemed to expect it. Things got really ugly then. They were all going to be arrested, and so the followers felt that they had to do it. They had to pretend that they didn't know him or they would go down with him. They felt terrible, confused, guilty, afraid, sad, angry with him that he let things go this far. And then he was gone, killed in the most humiliating way possible, cruelly executed with the common criminals and his tortured body thrown into a mass grave. One of his rich followers bribed the government to at least get his body back and put it into a tomb and rolled a heavy stone across to keep out the looters. At first, the followers were still just stunned. They didn't know what to do, where to go, who to see. They stayed hidden away in case they were still at risk and they could hardly look at each other out of their shame and grief. But two of them, his mother and his lover, thought that at least they could go and properly prepare his body for burial. As they walked there, they realized they wouldn't be able to move that huge stone by themselves and they wondered what they were going to do when they got there. But when they arrived, they realized they didn't need to worry. The stone had been moved away. But worse, the body of their beloved was gone. Where could it be? Did grave robbers take it? Did some malicious enemy take this opportunity for revenge? Or was it possible that something else far more mysterious had happened? Whatever this story may mean to you theologically, I find it to be a great story. And biblical scholars tend to agree that this was truly the original end of the story. This is where the oldest gospel, the Gospel of Mark, ends. The parts about the resurrection and Jesus appearing to the apostles came much later in later gospels. But it is at this point that I prefer to stay with the story from Mark to face the empty tomb, not knowing whether emptiness brings hopelessness or new possibilities. Few of us here probably believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, even though most of us still really don't know what happens after death. We can find ourselves like the children in our time for all ages, arguing, the body's in the ground, no, the body's in heaven, no, the body's in the ground, no, the body's in heaven. I remember doing a scattering of the ashes once for a beloved elder in the church whose grandchildren were very close to him. And one of the relatives leaned over and whispered to the four-year-old grandchild, well, at least you know he's in heaven now. And the child looked sort of side-eyed and said, no, he's in the urn, and we're about to scatter him. <laughs> Clearly a Unitarian Universalist child. <laughs> but I, for one, don't really feel a need to have complete or concrete answers about what happens after death, for really, we cannot ever truly know. This is only one of the profound questions of life on this earth that we can never fully have an answer to, and rather than trying to wrestle these questions into something that we know and feel like we can control, I prefer to leave it to a mystery 
that invites us into something truly spiritually profound. In her wonderful blog called Enfleshed, the Reverend Anna Bladell recently wrote this. I have long loved Rainer Maria Rilke's invitation written to a young poet to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves. And she says, I recently reread the whole letter. It's all about trusting wisdom which resides, which registers in the unsalable, unsayable, unconscious, unanswerable. It's about opening to those questions and feelings which in their depths have a life of their own. When we live the questions and unknow the answers of control, powerlessness, or inevitability, we open to wilder, freer, holier wisdoms. Sacred wisdom and precious life emerge when we carry within us the possibility of creating and forming rather than solving or resolving. Rilke identifies this as an especially blessed way of life. The crises and possibilities confronting our precious, collective, earthly, entangled life are unfolding in registers I can only begin to describe as ineffable. So much is happening, and so fast. Life is awe-inspiring. It is terrifying, too. The pace and scale of loss, violence, and disregard rupturing our world is bewildering. The breadth and depth of love and courage and dream and reweaving it otherwise is as well. So what are the unanswerable and yet profound questions that you are living into? Some that occur to me, will we ever get past our deep divisions? How can I get over my terrible grief? Where and how can I find joy? What makes my life more meaningful? These are not technical questions. They are not answered by coming up with concrete answers, and yet I find them to be the most important questions to attend to. Perhaps it's my own wishful thinking, but I believe that what Jesus, the human being, intended was not that people would create miracle stories of his bodily resurrection, but that they would finally listen to what he had been trying to say all along, that resurrection lies within us. That the kingdom of God is not something off in another world. It is here, among us, between us now. It resides in what kind of community we create together. That emptiness is not necessarily a disappointment, an unending reality, but in fact the embodiment of hope. That love will always find a way when we nurture it and feed it. The poet Karen Boyd put it this way, it hurts when buds burst. There is pain when something grows and when something must close. Then when it is worst and nothing helps, they burst as if in ecstasy, the first buds of the tree when fear itself is compelled to let go. They fall in a glistening veil, all the drops from the twigs, blinking away their fears of the new, shutting out their doubts about the journey, feeling for an instant how this is their greatest safety, to trust in the daring that shapes the world. Even in the best of times, we can find ourselves riding this seesaw between despair and hope. And when we do, we realize that at some point we must, as the poet says, trust in that daring 
which shapes the world. To trust in that daring that shapes the world. That is what Easter calls us to do, to trust, not necessarily in something new coming from outside, but in our own abilities to bring about our own renewal and that of those around us. It is only in emptiness that new life can take root. Renewal will come, it will come. We cannot force it, but we can trust that it lies just inside and outside of that empty tomb. Amen. Our final hymn <clears throat> is a Christmas, I mean a Christian classic, Shall We Gather at the River? And I invite you to think about it metaphorically as we think about resurrection metaphorically. Please rise. forever flowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of of the river, washing up its silver spray, we will walk and worship ever all the happy golden day. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful Christian fall in love with Unitarian Universalism was that as I learned more about the UU faith and about the values and beliefs that we hold dear and we fight for, I realized that the Jesus I knew, the Jesus I read about, would find a lot more in common with UUism than with modern day Christianity. We are often called radical. Well, 
Jesus' message of inclusion, about the inherent worth and dignity of all, was so radical that it got him killed. Looking at our world today, I can't help but think of Matthew 25, the passage right before Jesus' betrayal is described, in which he says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these siblings of mine, you did it to me. But what gets Jesus in trouble is that he doesn't stop there. He calls out those who puff their chests, who proclaim to be righteous, who hold themselves up as holier than thou at the expense of those they deem unworthy. To them, he says, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Today, laws are being created and people are being ostracized, discarded as unworthy by those who puff their chests, proclaim to be righteous, and who hold themselves up as holier than thou at the expense of those they deem unworthy. I'm pretty sure Jesus made it pretty damn clear on what side of these issues he falls. Which is why it's critical that today, on this Easter Sunday, we hold space to lift up and celebrate the fact that today is also Trans Day of Visibility. Heather Vickery writes for the UU Service Committee, the purpose of the International Transgender Day of Visibility is to truly celebrate the inherent worth of trans people, honor their contributions to society, and raise awareness of the oppression faced by this community worldwide. Maybe the fact that Easter and the Trans Day of Visibility fall on the same day this year is a signal to us all to remember, whether we are a Christian or not, that Jesus was a radical change maker who refused to deny anyone's full humanity. He undoubtedly would be taking risks to support his trans and gender expansive siblings and causing good trouble to bring the beloved community to our here and now. How beautiful then that these two celebrations align, reminding us that the empty tomb is left behind for our world of hope, joy, and possibility and that where a large percentage of those who proclaim to follow Jesus would rather complain about these celebrations falling on the same day this year, ultimately showing their hypocrisy, we can choose to live the life that Jesus actually taught, bled, and died for, whether we are Christian or not. I'd now like to invite Kai up here to share with us a personal testimony as to the power and importance of lifting up the voices and stories of our trans siblings. Hi everyone, my name is Kai and I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. I'm a white, thinnish 25 year old with blue eyes and shoulder length blue hair. I am trans masculine, I am non-binary, and I am gender fluid. And today I come with several members of my chosen family who I call friends, lovers, and housemates. Today marks the 15th anniversary of International Trans Day of Visibility. Rachel Crandall Cocker, a therapist from Michigan, founded and organized the celebration, and she herself has said that visibility can be a double-edged sword. It can put us in danger. But the point of this day of visibility is to highlight our beautiful and unique community of trans and non-binary people and to celebrate us. Clearly, in the past decade, we have gotten a lot of visibility, and that hasn't always been great, with coming out of various celebrities, creating discourse, 
and our rights to access public facilities being more loudly debated, but often loudly affirmed. Despite these challenges, we prove constantly that we are a beautiful and resilient people. At the end of our services, we repeat the verse, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of vision. As we go forth, let us transform ourselves and our world through reason and love. And I can think of no greater metaphor for transformation than transition. In doing so, as trans people, we are able to transform our bodies from our assigned sexes to our true genders and transform our minds from the emotional minefields of dysphoria to the oasis of self-recognition. Being truthful about transness is empowering. Because my parents had never heard of trans people when I started exploring my identity as a preteen, I wasn't allowed to bind my chest. My parents had just assumed that I was unreasonably concerned with modesty at the time. I ended up using handmade chest binders made in the night, hand sewn, that led to myself causing nerve damage in my spine that still tracks to my hands to this day. A decade later, my mom tells me that if I could have only told her what dysphoria was, if I could have told her what I needed, I might have been able to get it. The visibility of trans people in our culture today has validated these experiences to my mother and given her and countless others a frame of reference for us. I think, especially for that preteen age group, visibility is incredibly important. When puberty sets in, those whose bodies aren't going to develop as their minds will need to be able to live in truth with their bodies. And this goes doubly for non-binary people. I told you at the beginning that I use they, them, and he, him pronouns, but I haven't mentioned that before I haven't, uh, working in a corporate office job, I only was able to use he, him in the office and had to reserve they, them pronouns for my personal life. Uh, non-binary acceptance and visibility still have a way to go and non-binary people are often reduced to caricatures of irrationality and attention-seeking if we are mentioned at all. But my blue hair and pronouns have never prevented me from succeeding. My name is Kai, I am non-binary, and I am able to be out in my professional life, I am able to be out with my family, but this is all at the cost of visibility. But to anyone, especially my fellow trans people, if you want to be truly loved and truly known, first you must be truly seen. Thank you, Kai. Let us all now join in the words that Kai shared with us and extinguish our flame together. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of vision. As we go forth, let us heal and transform ourselves and our world through reason and love.